Seems like it's up now, right? Yeah, okay. Um, well, first of all, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a big honor to be here today. And I just wanted to thank um, Laura and Pablo before we start uh, for the invitation. Um, I prepared uh, like a really short presentation. It shouldn't take more than 20, 25 minutes. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And I think that the topic is um, very much down my interest. So yeah, I, it, it looks like it's going to be a very productive conversation uh, for myself as well. Um, so as you know, the title of my talk today is, is Between Mediums and Formats. And under this idea, I will share three projects that I've worked on both independently and in collaboration with other people. Um, so yeah, let's start. When, when I first got the invitation to give the talk, I was like very interested about the name of the seminar, Young Prototypes, and specifically, obviously the word prototype, which in its most basic and simple level, the word refers to a rudimentary working model or a sample from which copies are made. But once you kind of like break it down into its Greek roots, protos and typos, it literally translates to first mark or first impression. So this definition immediately brought uh, the next image to mind. It's a 4,000 year old clay tablet of Sumerian origin with the inscription of an architectural plan of a house. And this is an image that I go back to frequently when I talk about my work because I see what I do as a continuation of a similar way of recording ideas about space. And in the specific case of this plan drawing, the clay tablet is being used as a recording medium the stylus and the graduated ruler as inscription tools. And with the use of these tools, it was possible to mechanize the human hand to make marks systematically. And the action of making these marks reproducible and readable symbols turned them into a form of representation or a format. So the two parallel lines represent a wall and the lines perpendicular to those parallels represent a hole in the wall. I believe that the work that we do today as architects, I mean, it obviously still uses these primitive graphic conventions to communicate spatial concepts with other people. And although we may, might have replaced the clay tablet and the stylus with new tools, prototyping is still kind of like at the core of, of what we do in practice and research of architecture. So with this overall idea in mind, I will talk about these three projects um, as a process of translation between mediums and formats. And what is pictured right now at the, in, on the screen is the, 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 fir, like the, the three prototypes for these projects. And I will describe how that works for each one of them um, as I go on the presentation. So the first project is uh, titled A Pile of CLT. And this project started uh, with like a very conventional understanding of a prototype. It started with a series of simple sketches, simple line drawings that describe in very rough ways how I imagined using CLT panels to break down a space into a series of rooms and at the same time to create like the structure of interlocking walls. So as you can see on the first drawing on the left, uh, the idea started like very simply like a box with a cross shaped subdivision to give kind of like the, the exterior walls rigidity. Um, and in towards the third uh, drawing, right here. It's as if the cardboard, uh, a cardboard box divider has lost its box 
and it shows kind of like a free arrangement of walls of and creating rooms of different sizes. So after this step and kind of like after being, I guess, attracted by this uh, very rough primitive idea of uh, interlocking CLT panels, which is not easy, obviously, because of the scale uh, of this construction technique, I moved on to a 3D model and started testing these ideas as rough compositions of planes. Um, the goal initially and the goal in these models was not to find the right organization of space or whether this would work structurally or how to put them together. They were meant only just as a way to visualize the formal implications of the strategy that was outlined in the sketch drawings. Um, and these on the screen were the very first um, models that I did for the project. And I, uh, from this point onward, um, my questions were like, okay, in order to give this uh, more clear image of the actual expression of, uh, of the sketch that I was making, I need to visualize it as a construction process. So at this point, I decided to think of the project as a sequence of stacked uh, floor plates and um, subdivision of, of walls. So I created this second model and animated it as a, as a stacking sequence. And it, it was also this point of the design process that I started kind of testing out some specific rules about the design, um, namely um, the shift of every plant panel in the floor plates, different types of openings, and a big roof that is topping the whole structure to that give gives the design kind of the character of, of a house. Um, in the end, this model allowed me to kind of visualize more clearly what the output of this way of uh, designing would be. And I think it, it captured um, the majority of the design aspects and rules that I was going to move forward with in, in the project. So after this uh, model, kind of very precise things like knowing the exact dimensions of the openings and, and their location or the exact angle at which uh, the walls should meet, um, you know, given like the specific program or the structure, that's what um, came after um, this 3D model. And in parallel, I was making these um, tests. Uh, I was playing with the idea of giving the solid timber of CLT uh, an expression. And I found this uh, Japanese technique um, that is used to finish off uh, wood. And the process basically consists of sandblasting the surface of, of the wood and expose the grain, and then painting over the rough surface and then sanding it down to give this kind of distinct um, graphic pattern. So that I, I took these tests and incorporated them back into the 3D model in, in kind of like a revised version. And yeah, you can see it there on, on the under, underside of, of the roof. Um, at this stage, I kind of like went back into, into, a three, into the 3D model, start to uh, make more decisions about the design what is the expression of the roof? Uh, what is the expression of the skylights? What, how does the house meet the ground? And at this point, thing, like rules about the openings, where and how the walls intersect um, was done in a more carefully because I use this model as the base for uh, developing uh, uh, the fabrication of a physical scale model. So I translated um, this 3D model into an actual breakdown of the pieces that would make it up uh, as, as, as a physical model. And this is the catalog of all the CLT, um, CLT uh, panels in the house. Uh, so by breaking down kind of like the abstract nature of a 3D model, now suddenly problems like 
notching and like how wide those notches have to be uh, in each specific intersection, things like that start to matter, right? Because it's you're suddenly dealing with the material qualities, the thickness of, of a material that varies uh, in each intersection because every intersection is at a different angle. So every intersection is a different, um, requires a different thickness. In the end, uh, this led to like the fabrication of these, uh, this model. And to me, it, it served less as a final output, but more as a tool to understand the, the three-dimensional, like the digital model, as a way to prove that it was actually possible to assemble something physical uh, in that way. Um, so for example, in this case, for me, this model was not a, a prototype, but just a proof of concept. The design of, of this house and what we're seeing right now uh, on the screen is the one of the plans of the house and a plan of a tower. Um, the design of the house was um, used as a DNA for a, the, a tower, like a, a, a mid-rise tower. Um, so we're basically taking the composition rules of, of a very uh, small, simple project and then applying them to a, a big, a larger program, a larger um, kind of structural complexity. And, and the design, in the end, the, 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 the resulting design was merely the, the output of replicating the logic of the house vertically. And I made some adjustments to the design, like reducing the size of the floor plates as, as the height increases. But overall, it can be understood as a derivative of the original sketch that I showed at the beginning of the presentation. Um, other elements were also translated. The wood finishing technique was reinterpreted as a, an embossed aluminum panel that was used in the underside of the overhangs. And yeah, you can see that cladding on the image on the left. And on the right, um, uh, showing just the rendering of the tower uh, under construction on its site in Raleigh, North Carolina. So in the end, um, these were two images that were produced for the publication of, of a book. And we decided to present the projects again back in, in, it, in their most simplified form, like back to their most abstract compositions. So for the tower, it was important to show the texture that was achieved by the simple shifting of the slabs and the irregular arrangement of, of the walls. <laughs> um, so yeah, like, like the, these, these representations um, are aiming for for an abstract expression of an or like a, a more defined stage of the project. And then as a as a little kind of like uh, offshoot, uh, as part of the material that um, was generated for the publication, we had the chance to work with a pretty uh, like a very famous, a uh, structural engineering firm based in London called AKT2 um, to run some tests on our designs. And what is interesting here for me and for the matters of, of this um, talk is that I see it again as a translation into a new format. The panels no longer try to represent kind of like the visual uh, aesthetics of wood in CLT but instead they represent kind of like a mathematical model that helps us as architects evaluate design decisions. So from these tests, for example, uh, we realized that the roof that I had proposed abstractly in, in a 3D model uh, had to be structured with a different system, right? So things like that, like uh, it is in the translation uh, that we find new information and that we test our ideas. Okay, so this is the second prototype that I want to talk about. It's a painting and it's called 
el Valle de México, visto eh, el Valle de México desde el Tepeyac, by Mexican landscape painter Jose Maria Velasco. And uh, what I'm showing here, the, the one that I'm showing right now on the screen is just one out of seven versions that he uh, made of this from this exact location. In in all of the ver in all of the seven versions and in other paintings that he did of the region, Velasco represented kind of like abstracted or imagined vernacular architecture. Um, these are these six are just six examples of what I mean by this. Um, simple horizontal structures with a very distinctive profile and mass void relationship. So we took these attributes, we took the, this imagined version of a vernacular architecture as a prototype um, to design a house in Singilucan and started to design with similar constraints as in uh, Velasco's architecture, a new version uh, of the abstracted structures in the paintings. So these early drawings I did of the plan and the elevation of the house, um, you can see that already uh, there, there is, I, I started to establish the relationship between the two drawings where the outline of the plan mirrors the elevation. And it's also worth noting that in this very early study, um, there are different window types in the facade that then got scrapped um, because it was too specific. It was not abstract enough. This are like this is the second round of sketching out some ideas. Uh, I was trying to come up with rules for the project, specific dimensions and angles, geometric relationships between each each part of the house. And as you can see in the in in, in the first on the on the drawing on the left, like now all, all the windows except but one, they're all square. <laughs> and then on the drawing. To the right, uh, all the windows are rectangular. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to maintain, like I said, I wanted to maintain kind of like the abstract quality that was characteristic of the tiny buildings in the paintings because they were painted in so small, right? Not because he liked rectangular windows, which I do, but um, in the case of the paintings, it was because it was there was not enough uh, resolution to give them like a specific geometry. So yeah, in the end, I wanted the house to look like an out of scale object with like a simple wall in, and, and holes in the wall. Now, like after these drawings with a rough idea of kind of like the rules that I was going to be designing around, I, I started working on the computer and I like to to show these these drawings because we can see kind of like the subtle adjustments I was testing in the design process. Um, at this point specifically, uh, I was discussing with my partners and we were wondering if the house had to be designed only with one fixed proportion of rectangles that you can see pictured on the left drawing on the on the second row. To where, on the left, you can see that the whole elevation is built out of the rectangles with the same proportion. Uh, or if we could like bring squares into the mix, that is what's pictured on the right. Um, and that makes like the effect visually is like very minor and almost imperceptible. But the reason why we were going into much detail about this is because the, because the, the elevation and the plan are being negotiated by a sloping roof, um, kind of finding the right dimensions of every um, height in, in the facade was, was very, very important. So in the end, this is the, the design that we ended up with. And uh, just to describe it a little bit, we incorporated all the programs of the house in a, in a main uh, sequence of, of rooms and kind of like an irregular enfilade that is flanked by two open spaces, which are um, the ones next to the bedrooms. And, and then at the, uh, at the end of this long wall, there is uh, a storage room 
um, that serves kind of the, the exterior and, and, and the rest of the property. The, um, this point of the design for us uh, was very important uh, because it usually if, if a project is not going to go under construction, perhaps you can leave it up to here to this point, right? Um, you can understand what the overall uh, spatial organization is, what the formal expression of the building is. But because this was um, a project that was meant to go um, into construction, it was it had to be translated again, right? And I, I want to emphasize that that's the importance that I see in, in construction documents because I see them as an important translation of format, right? Now, this time the, the medium of drawing operates more closely as a precise set of instructions for the builders to follow. And there is a, one can understand as a literal change of language that happens from a representational drawing into an operative drawing. So in a similar way that the stylus and the clay were used as a medium, the construction process can also be understood as a process of inscription. I like this photo because it shows kind of like the first impression of the house on the site or the prototypos of the building. These are a few more photos of the construction process. Um, and, and, and these photos are meant to uh, serve not only as kind of like documentation of, you know, how the workers are, if they're doing it correctly or incorrectly, but also used as a medium of representation of the house. So uh, try to capture the haphazardness or the controlled chaos in the construction site, try to capture the simple tools and materials that uh, went into creating this building um, almost as the scenography for a play. Um, or in this case, in the picture on the left, how can we even emphasize even further uh, the flatness that I was referring to or the abstract quality that I was talking about uh, in the paintings? But in this case, we, one can understand it as a JPEG brick texture overlaid uh, on top of the landscape. And this is the final result in the lens of Daniel Alonso. Um, I think he did a really good job in capturing the rigidity of the house and kind of like the flatness that we were aiming for in the design. Um, in the image on the right, you can see the sequence of, of openings and, and rooms that I was describing in the plan drawing. And this is the view from the back where you can see the, the sloping metal roofs that I was uh, mentioning are negotiating between the elevation and the plan. And the image on the right, that's the client right there with uh, his dog. And yeah, just framing kind of like the views of, of the landscape. So it, just in general, and to describe a little bit of kind of the intentions of the house, the overall material expression of the house is left in this raw uh, exposed materials, both in the exterior and the interior. Um, towards the exterior, the intention was to present the house as a continuous brick surface without any other elements showing up. And toward the interior, that's where all the structural concrete elements start to show and start to suggest the relation uh, between adjacent walls. So in that image on the right, there is uh, this vertical uh, concrete element that actually is the uh, is suggesting that there is a wall behind uh, this wall connecting and, and getting linked into this uh, part right here. So, so we understand it almost as a um, grammar or like exposed grammar uh, of, of the house towards the interior. One of the main points that I want to make today is that anything can be considered a prototype of something else. Even something 
complex and carefully put together, like a completed building, uh, can become a prototype of, of, of a new thing. So in this case, we, we used um, the house as the main character for a video game we developed in collaboration with Dutch illustrator Sander Verbeck uh, or Papa Ferrari, uh, as you can find him on Instagram. The game is available online on our website uh, or on the free gaming platform itch.io and you can play a non-game. It, 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 it isn't really an actual game with missions or uh, like points or anything like that. It is really a, a piece of interactive architectural representation. If you talk to the cows, they will give you a detailed description of the concept of the house, while other objects in space tell other parallel stories. One of them, uh, one of the objects inside the house actually hints at the next project I will talk about today. Finally, um, as an inside joke and as a way to close a loop of references, we added a uh, Jose Maria Velasco painting in the game as an, as an Easter egg. And that's the, the image pictured on the right. Okay, uh, almost done. <laughs> um, this is the last prototype and it's, it's a fragment of, of a novel. Um, it's a fragment of a novel written by a close friend and now collaborator, I guess. Uh, his name is uh, Juan Rivera Arroyo. He's uh, a young Mexican writer. And his novel is entitled Albert Speer, One Day. Um, I, will, I will read the, the fragment just so that as a, as a, as a way to describe um, the rest of, of the project. Okay, so it says, the house on the hill would be a long corridor. It would lead nowhere or come from nowhere. The corridor, six meters wide, would be circular. The house would be the corridor. Inhabiting it would mean moving through it at all times. The circular design was committed to the well-being of its residents with Al Alzheimer's syndrome. The purpose was that after an episode of forgetfulness, the resident could determine his temporal location from his spatial location. The distribution of the areas in the project could be explained with a clock's face. Dividing the plan into 12 sections, the bedroom was in the space that corresponded between 12 and two. Between two and three, the dressing room. Between three and 4.30, the breakfast room. Between 4.30 and seven, the study. Between seven and nine, the dining room. Between nine and 11, the living room and between 11 and 12, the balcony. The passage of time ordered the arrangement of the rooms. It is worth mentioning that between the rooms, there were no doors or, no, no, no doors or walls. As the day progressed, the resident had to move clockwise. The architectural design was also the design of the resident's routine. The day began in the bedroom, of course, and ended there too after, completing, after a complete run through the house. If suddenly confused, he opened his eyes and found himself in the study, the resident had to interpret that he had previously been in the bedroom, in the dressing room, and in the breakfast room, and that the next steps were to eat dinner in the dining room, go to the living room to have a digestive, and perhaps light the fireplace, go out to the balcony to watch the sunset, and finally go to sleep in the bedroom. The design assumed windows only on the inside wall of the corridor, which opened onto a round garden in the center of the house. The other wall had a graph of the progression of the hours painted on it, pointing in a clockwise direction. The kitchen and bathroom were located outside the circular hallway in two small neighboring buildings. To inhabit the house, it would be inevitable to enter the dynamics of time. The only way around the design's purpose would be to locate yourself in the center of the round garden in the static center of the rotating axis. Okay, so I took this passage and translated it into a simple drawing. And this started a conversation between the two of us. And now uh, we're working on 10 houses for which sometimes the text or narrative is the prototype and for which some of them 
it is the drawing that precedes the text. We are um, giving this project specific format constraints. The text will only be dialogues and the drawings will all be technical drawings. So the house on of the hill, uh, which is the story that I just um, read, is now in its 2.0 version with a revised text now in the format of a dialogue and a revised drawing that is an ongoing kind of process and will get to a higher level of, of technical resolution. This is the House of Memory, which was also prototyped in, in another one of Juan, Juan's novels, The House of the Broken Memory. This is the house for the standing giant that started as an architectural doodle and now has its narrative. And finally, uh, the house without an interior, which was born from a competition proposal that we didn't win. And now it lives as a fictional piece of literature. Okay, so that's it. But just to conclude, I wanted to add that um, what interests me the most about the idea of a prototype is that anything can be uh, interpreted as the first mark of something else. And it is in the act of translating between mediums uh, or creating something new that an object becomes a prototype. I guess that what I'm trying to say is that nothing is a prototype in its own right. It only becomes one uh, when understood as part of a creative process. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Edgar. I think we can um, let Matt take over for a second and open the questions. Sure, let's do it. Hi, Edgar. Yeah, thanks. That was a uh, that was awesome. I really enjoyed uh, this, I, this idea of translation and how we like you learn new interpretations of whatever idea or concept. I think that's super powerful. I haven't really, I've never thought of it like that. I've always just kind of segmented like this is an idea and it's kind of turned <laughs> into this right but but no that's that's very interesting and uh so yeah that's i enjoy that a lot i'm, I'm glad i'm glad that was that came across <laughs> how did, did did that how did that come through to you was that like yeah. uh, was that Actually, did you find that in during like your studies or yeah well i think it's you know it's always a i mean to be completely fair it's something that just came to mind while preparing this lecture. So again, it's a, it's in the translation of, you know, from just photos of my work and a, bun like a bunch of folders with a bunch of files and drawings. And uh, when you actually translate that into the format of a presentation, you create something new out of it. Uh, so that's when it really hit me. But um, yeah, in my uh, when I was doing my um, graduate st studies, uh, there was a reading on the toolmaker's paradigm, and I need to find like the the, the right um, name of 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 the reading. But basically, what they said is that um, the only way of to actually learn is to produce something, right? To engage with it uh, uh, directly and to use tools to create something new. And, and it is that in the process of creation that you actually create knowledge. Um, so that's, I think, um, it was a very revealing moment for me, you know, that knowledge is not, does not come from, it, it doesn't come only from reading and, you know, looking at Pinterest and having a bunch of references, uh, but in actually trying to make, trying to create something, even if it's not something original, like even building a, a, a model of a reference will tell you more than just looking at the images on Google images, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's in the embodied kind of like action of measuring, cutting, preparing a file that you 
create new knowledge out of something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's my answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that makes sense. It's like a like application is like the best way to learn. And I guess maybe a, one more to like thing past that would be like teaching is another way, which is kind yeah. of kind of what you're doing in a sense. And how you came to this was through this lecture and teaching and spreading that information. Mm -hmm. And then that you get like a deeper understanding. Yes. This understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that can be anything, right? Like I was mentioning that process of translation can be between drawing types, it can be between a drawing and a model. It can be between a model and a physical model. It, you know, like it, it really is this kind of like shift uh, in gears, I think, that is like a productive type of friction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, def I definitely see that. Yeah, or like a, a writing to a, to a drawing <laughs> like you're doing there. Uh, yeah, exactly. But like in that specific project, uh what is in, really interesting to me is that it's outlining outlining a very general idea of what the, those structures are but not the detail and that's where i come in as a designer right so for the house of the hill it's a circle and it's like a the face of a clock it never describes the roof so I will make that decision, right? Like that is going to become then the, uh, I guess, opportunity to add something else to, to that prototype, right? To add a level of resolution that is not um, there at that moment. Uh, well, in terms of uh, like your CLT, like in all your experience with that, like, what did you see as like some limitations of civil CLT, like based on your like extensive research, especially like I'm really interested in that, like interlocking connection yeah. too, and how they're all unique. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning that all of the like all of that work was done in the in academic environment, so it was never meant to kind of. Um, progress into construction or any other type of like real world uh, applications. Uh, it was meant to serve as a speculative um, kind of departure point to test and see if like these ideas were even possible, right? Like just to question the, the, their feasibility. Um, so that's, yeah, just from the start, it, they were never meant to be um, built or, or anything like that. So we had a lot of flexibility on how we wanted each one of us could, um, uh, imagine, right? Like the application of CLT, uh, in my case, it was in the, uh, exactly in, in the slotting or in the, um, fitting together that was kind of like the invention, if you want to call it in some way, right? Because usually you meet, you join CLT at 90 degrees, right? Like they're specific uh, steel brackets that, you know, they're designed for that. And yeah. if you want to cut uh, like maybe a slot, you can do it, but it's easier if you do it at um, perpendicular to the surface of the CLT because the way that the CNC machine works just that's the way it works, right? Yeah. Um, the way what I what I was proposing would require to do a flip mill, right? Which is mm. at that scale is ridiculous to think about, <laughs> just because of the scale and weight of these things, um, and the level of precision that is would be required to achieve something like that. It would make it hard, uh, maybe unfeasible. Uh, but not impossible. Um, so I think like that was um, the ambition was not to come up with like a technically uh, resolved kind of like detail or technically resolved new type of application for CLT, but rather to uh, uh, find or question 
if CLT buildings all had to look like cardboard boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're kind of like, you're pushing the limits of like what CLT can really be. At least trying to imagine the possibilities, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's cool too, because like, it's interesting how you have this, like it's a theoretical approach, but then you translated it into this like very, uh, it's like the structural diagram that you're talking about. And you, you see that it still performs. So there's, I could see that as like a, an opportunity to that that shows some validity with this idea to where this has some this some yeah. positive outcomes like it has has a lot of um, protected like a very like rigid like sheer protection. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I think um, yeah, at that point where uh, the engineers took our models and started running tests uh, on them, like that really kind of validated all these efforts, right? Like. That was the, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, the, the moment where everything made sense. Like, because before, before that, the whole process was very much um, fueled or, or, or uh, the discussions were around conceptual ambitions of the project, the aesthetics, uh, the, the expression of, of the designs. But once it came down to actually evaluating the design decisions and the proposals uh, uh, structurally, that's where it was like, it got really interesting because I can already imagine how uh, you can fall into like this feedback loop of translation between design engineering, design engineering, design engineering. And, you know, like then I, I want to go back like, now I, I wish I had time, you know, to go back, take those um, engineering studies, and and make adjustments to the design, and then running running it again and see what what to what we learn, what what changes, right, in the design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to, like how, how did those like did was there like a like was like a parametric thing or something with the the different angles and stuff so like or was that kind of like an improvisation? Kind of deal. Yeah, there was I, there was a point in the design process that I tried to mess around with Grasshopper when I was moving into the the tower. Mm -hmm. I, I was like very confident that <laughs> I could program the whole thing and it just bake. You're done, and you can build a model like immediately. Um, but no, it was a much more like um, just by hand. Kind of process. I, I know. So I we, see, oh, we, no, yeah. we, I, I was just going to say, Matt, sorry, sorry for interrupting, but we're kind of here, kind of fighting to, to make a comment between me and Laura. I'm going to let Laura go okay. first before letting the, 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 our, our students jump in. Nick, you can go after, but Laura, please. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, um, Matt, your questions are great. I'm just like dying to ask Edgar. Yeah. Uh, uh, a question uh, because of what you've what you've brought up and where the conversation is going um i i think it's so interesting this idea that the kind of first uh trace let's say for the clt project is really in the pursuit of abstraction um and that the uh, almost like the assembly or the fabrication the rigor uh, was a, in a way a second step or part of that translation that you speak of. And uh, similarly, uh, what I find super fascinating now that you've um, uh, had the presentation, the, I find super fascinating the painting of, uh, <laughs> um, the painting of Velasco, is that? Mm. Yeah, Velasco. Um, where, you know, as architects, we often look at, um, we often look at our context uh, and we look at the region around us. There's a kind of interest generally in the vernacular. I mean, not for everyone, but I think for sure for us. And the fact that you didn't look around you in the physical space, you looked around you in the painting, like in mm. art which has already undergone a process of translation and is already an abstraction. So that's kind of your starting point. And I find that totally fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, as you are discussing the, the successive uh, moments 
of translation for your project as it starts to become, uh, you know, realized and and go through the construction documentation and you're talking about proportion in terms of negotiating the um, the roof slopes and so on. I, I was starting to wonder, you know, if you could speak a little bit more about um, the necessity of these things to exist in the real world um, or, you know, if you could do without. I love building buildings. <laughs> so uh, I don't know, I'm biased. <laughs> uh, but but I also love abstraction. Like as, as you were saying, like there is something that really attracts me a lot about the uh, I don't know, like the possibilities of of abstract like adding more resolution reducing resolution and then go this back and forth of like grains it interests me a lot because then in the compression and decompression you start to find new gaps for design and ultimately for me like it's all about finding opportunities for me to make decisions about design, designing something, anything really. Like, for example, in the in 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 that house, um, yeah. Like, how do you design a facade, right? Like, th that's it. Like that exercise, you know, that seems so simple and so like irrelevant, but when you're at it, you're like that's all you have, like it's you versus some rectangles and you have to make decisions about rectangles, right? Like, because if you don't, then you didn't. And it's as, an, as a designer and for me as an, as an architect, I, I like to have kind of like an argument of why I'm making decisions about my my projects, right? So I, I, I see it as, as that. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, looking at, at the paintings as a departure point, I mean, of course one, um, you know, like I visited the site, I, I'm, I grew up around uh, the area where the house was built. I am very familiar with that type of environment, um, both architecturally, culturally, um, in terms of um, in terms of climate. So I was trying to find kind of like a different way of looking at the context, right? Like a, a, a different way that would be productive for the project that would allow us to create something in our eyes unusual or unique or or exciting but it's still part of the context so yeah it was kind of like in that um i don't know exercise of trying to just find sources of 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 inspiration if it, to put it in like very simple terms i think Nick had a question. If you want to go, I yeah, can sure. I can start uh, answering like more quickly if we have to wrap up. But yeah, no, we're, no. I mean we, it's only if you that have to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I I was gonna ask about your like kind of exploration into the. I mean it was kind of touched on with the you talking about the varying resolutions of like that painting and then how you then translated that into like a video game experience. How did that like further develop your like thought process on this particular project? And also how did that come to be in the first place? Um, it's super interesting that you have this cool project and then you're able to like scale it down to like <laughs> really small pixels and then like further explore it and, and tell its story that way. Yeah. So I'm curious about that. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the way that this, that part of the project came to be was almost like circumstantial. Uh, I met um, Sander uh, through Instagram. We uh, kind of like each other's work and we wanted to collaborate uh, on something together. So we were like, um, he proposed like, hey, let's try to, I, I did this small uh, video game for myself why don't we try to do something similar with one of your projects? And I was like, yeah, let's, let's try it out with, with this project of the house. And, and that was the result. I mean, to be completely honest and open about my particular way of understanding my work and my process is that um, I never have really like a pretty predetermined plan, right? Like it, it, it's really about, to me, it's really about allowing or allowing the space for experimentation. And to me, making that video game was a, an experiment. And as I, as I said, like, uh, I think the result is more of an experiment on architectural representation than it is in kind of like exploring the ideas of the house beyond. I mean, it's applying kind of like or translating the ideas of the house into the form into the medium of a video game, uh, but in itself, it's an experiment in architectural representation. It's the same as if I would make, let's say, uh, press uh, representations or like you know drawings for the media about this house. You know, the the build project then goes into this translation process, gets simplified. Maybe you fix some things that didn't turn out quite well and you send out those drawings to be published in, in um, I don't know, like websites or, or news, uh, newspapers or journals or whatever. So it's a similar way with this um, video game, right? It, it's, it's the process of translating into, an, uh, into a new medium that I find productive in the sense of as an experiment almost. I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, one had a question as well. Yes, Juan. Hi, Edgar. Um, Hi, hello. Yeah, thank you. Great to see you virtually again. Um, I. I like always loved what you said, and I find it super intriguing and really uh, motivating. But um, I wanted to go, uh, now that we've talked a lot about your infinite creativity towards, looks like in one direction, uh, like to the front, I just wanted to make more of an academic question probably and saying if there is a way backwards too, because it's really interesting that we were talking yesterday about archetypes and prototypes. It's pretty, it's pretty um, uh, a good moment to talk about that because in a lecture about models, we were talking exactly this about this at Tulane. And, um I've, I we did this analysis in which we um understood prototypes as permanent origins as something that is a, a dynamic question and at the same time is linked to a to an origin and then we introduced also the concept of archetype which is more the the static the the perfection the permanent the the reminiscent and I was. It's 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 always a little bit magnetic to magnetic to go, to talk about linguistics, even if we don't know a lot. And it's always speculating, and also that it, it introduces design, also in this, probably in the concept of language. But do you find it also peaceful at some times, also perhaps, or to avoid anxiety of constantly creating more and more and more to go back and try to find in a permanent origin in the static shape of the representation of the impossible to represent the representation of the the roof, the representation of the mother, the representation of the chair, uh, something that has no image, also something important in this way backwards? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that it's very important actually in the, in the process of design to always have like a, something that is carried through that whole process, right? It's not about like the, 
complete mutation of something into something completely different. Um, to me, uh, and I don't know how else to put it, but there is always kind of like a conceptual ambition in each project. And that's what I, what ties all these objects uh, together. While they might seem or look all different or seem that look, showing uh, kind of like visual trans translation or translations between mediums, the, to me, the, the archetype or like the permanent thing is um, a system of logic that is embedded in, in each one of the versions of, uh, uh, you know, of the, of the process. And, and yeah, like, I think like that to me is fundamental to any architectural project. Like to me, that's the, really where our expertise is, is in like knowing how to go from point A to point B and maintaining the core um, values of of the of the original idea. So I don't know, like in that sense, um, like I would I, I understand um, this or, or the way that I was talking about prototype in 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 the lecture was more of understanding it as as the process of of as a process period right like as something that that is uh continuous and and not with the ambition of like always like keep doing things <laughs> right like there's a lot of projects that i you know that haven't touched in in years um but but really as um maybe as a productive way to approach architectural design and architectural research really right mm -hmm. like it's in, it, I, I see that in the translation that's the moment where you find um, new information uh, so so it's really more like okay it's in the friction of translating it's in the friction of changing mediums that one goes about um, finding making yeah finding new new things about um, anything really um yeah maybe yeah i i want to continue the conversation on that it's 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 a, it's it's a hard one it's something i mean it's not a hard question it's a hard conversation i would say it's a very long one it's something that keeps obsessing me we because it's also related to the concept of um or to the idea of giving shape to the mm -hmm. is it related for example to the concept of a style of an architect should we try to give shape to the to our original prototype as an architect and that's how we identify every architect in this process that you referred to which can be forward or backwards or what i was i didn't mean to say that you were always like trying to create more but just <laughs> in this process no of, of, of moving yeah. uh, but at the same time we normally tend to go back as architects or even as humans to an original point that is more and more defined probably every day mm. right? it's called shape yeah. and and then does it stop because of that being a prototype or definitely it stops being an archetype? But does it become an original changing prototype that it's embedded in us? It's a, I think it's something that we can keep discussing, but just we will have the chance. But I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, definitely think that in, in the practice, you know, like my personal practice, there are obviously ideas that I go back to in every project. Right. And it's almost like a back, like as you're describing, it's almost backwards, backward engineering to that point. Right. I, I know <laughs> that I want to get to this point. <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, that also becomes kind of like, um, I guess, specific for each practice. And that's what really defines like the different approaches to, to architecture, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, and these like specific approaches, like you talked about, like you, because you, as we've explored and on is on your website as well. Like you've done a lot of different like mediums in terms of like how you express your your creativity. Like you've done curatorial, web design, apparel, publications, and stuff like that. And so I'm I'm curious as to like how how that affects your design process. Not and maybe not even specifically like just architecture. 
but more open to just your design process in general, like how you would go and tackle any any one of these uh, design issues. Right. Um, yeah, like I mentioned briefly, I think it's through um, like I mean, I don't I don't want to sound pretentious, but like it's a it's a conceptual uh, exercise, really, and it can have the form of anything really uh, and that's why you know it sometimes get manifested in in a building and sometimes it's a t-shirt and sometimes is um, I don't know like uh, an exhibition and it's really more about the idea and less about um, the final output right so one could imagine that let's say that the the house uh, in Singulukan didn't get built. Um, this, the ideas will still be there, right? Like it will still be a house which the elevation gets reflected onto the plan. And to me, that's what's like the core, you know, thread through like the whole project. Um, and maybe that can be represented on, you know, like that's like a uh, scratch scratch off uh, the lottery, you know, that you have one layer and then you scratch it off. Like I was, the other day I was imagining, what if I did like a lottery bill with the elevation of the house and then scrap it and you see the plan behind it and it's the exact same overlay, right? Like, so it doesn't matter really like what's the medium in which you're presenting the idea, but the idea itself. I don't know if that makes sense. So Beautiful, that's yeah. that's how I approach like any project really. So yeah, just wait for the scratchy representation. Uh, it's coming up 2024. Okay, all right. I look forward <laughs> to it. I think uh, I'll have something to say. Um, yeah, uh, thanks. I mean, without, I, I don't want to, to kind of like take up too much of your time. So I'll try to be super concise, Edgar, but uh, <laughs> One thing <clears throat> that I could say is that you can't stop doing stuff. <laughs> and Marela looks, you know, amazing and, and, and fascinating. And that after this lecture, I kind of want to be able to talk to you in person again for, for a while um, and, you know, and share work and learn more about what you're doing now, like, like we used to do last semester when we were uh, together in person. And just for, for our students, I think uh, this lecture, this, you know, Laura was saying it at the beginning, but it couldn't be. A better, a better way of starting, right? It's just like to see Edgar talking about um, design and practice in such, you know, with such an enthusiasm, like really, really excited about what he's doing and also about sharing it with us and kind of uh, translating uh, that, that excitement to us is something that I hope is inspiring for, for you all, for our students in, in, the, in this uh, elective. And I guess what I wanted to, to ask um, to kind of tie back to your early uh, remarks is, you know, uh, what would be the first mark or, you know, the kind of starting point that you could say as kind of like as an instrumental thing that, you know, maybe the word advice is kind of not the best word, but something that you could tell our students as, you know, what you remember as a good first mark, as a good first prototype that kind of starts your process you know, or a way of making or of thinking, they're all grad students who are just about to graduate. So what is that first mark that they could, you know, take? <laughs> um, you mean like in my experience? Yeah, for example. What, you know, was, like what was the thing that first marked my... Um... Yeah, something that, you know, as, as a practitioner or, you know, mm. or a, as a grad student, something where you thing that you start to identify your process, your way of making, your way of thinking. Hmm. <laughs> um, that's a really tough question. I never really thought about it. I feel like I'm in, you know, in <laughs> therapy right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but uh, all jokes aside, I think that there were two moments that really started to shape this approach. The first one was early in undergrad, like maybe in third year or something like that. Um, we had to, you know, like we had studio like any other year. And I don't know why, but for some reason, like 
it just clicked. And I understood that architecture or a big part of architecture was to make, make ideas, uh, sorry, rules for yourself, right? And make rules uh, about designs and have abstract things kind of dictate the decisions that you make about um, a design. So when I realized that, um, I think that that really shaped um, my approach to the whole thing. First, it was more obviously expressed formally, right? Like, okay, everything has to be uh, like a square, right? And okay, that's one side of it. But to the previous point, that can also mean like an overarching idea or an overarching goal or so. I think that idea started to, or is, is it continues to, to develop uh, as as I you know like work more, um, and the second one was, um, I guess, going into practice and just finding out how hard it is to push a project through. Um, Something as simple as, you know, like take for example that the, the house that I presented today. I mean, on paper it sounds like even dumb, right? Like, I, yeah, like this guy did a house, big deal. But it is not until like the moment where you try to actually go through the whole design process, the construction process, uh, negotiating with the client, with the real world, with engineers, with materials, with costs with all of those things, I think that that really shaped my approach to the whole thing to be, I guess, less precious about um, specific aspects of, of architecture. I'm not saying, I'm not going to say like how it looks because I do care how things look in the end, but for example, less tied or, uh, to, to specific things. And I see a lot of architectural practices trying to you know, like get married to to a style or to a material or to a color. And it's like, it, it, that's really hard. I mean, maybe in some contexts or for some types of projects that works really well, but in, in, in the way that I try to understand it is that if without, you know, like if you don't do that, um, you're open for for more possibilities. You open yourself up for more possibilities. Um, so yeah, that was like the second, like big, <laughs> uh, first mark. Well, not first, but second <laughs> mark. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Edgar. I think that's all the time we have for today, but I really appreciate you yeah. sharing all these projects and really interesting ideas and ways to think about an idea and a concept. It's, yeah, it's my, my pleasure. It was great to be here and it's, uh, always great to talk with, um, students and yeah I, I I love these conversations and I'm looking forward to to the next weeks and see what my colleagues have to say about prototypes <laughs> or archetypes <laughs> <laughs> or types or style <laughs> thanks Edgar thanks so much yeah thank you guys thank thanks you so much Edgar. and thanks Matt bye bye thank see you all thank you all for being here Thank you. I have a quick question. Hello? Hi. I have a quick question. Now we are going to school to see each other. Oh, yeah. Practical question. Yeah. Yes. 10 minute break, uh, please. And then we'll see you all in Shiver 131. Okay. okay. Bye.